first gig that Midnight Oil played was in a small surf clubby thing on the coast of New South Wales. The first gig that I went to by myself was Spider Bait. I was lucky I get to go to like Grinspoon or Friends or Rom. Australia has a proud history of homegrown music and a passion for live concerts. I was 14, 15 years old and I saw Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs. But the live music industry is under siege. We're in an extinction event right now. And we have to beg for scraps. While Australia's music festivals and small venues are fighting for survival, a multinational company, Live Nations, crashed the scene. Sucking up profits and taking over the industry. They use, and I would say misuse, their market power. It's being accused of using its business model to plunder competition. Well, they fucked it up, basically. In this Four Corners, we reveal serious allegations that Live Nation is ripping off fans by charging hidden ticket fees and exploiting some of the country's most talented musicians. Now, industry insiders are speaking out in a last-ditch effort to save Australia's live music culture. They don't care about our stories. They don't care how our music moves people. A country without its own music is a country without a soul. Peter Garrett, the iconic Australian rock star and frontman of Midnight Oil, has graced stages with his activist <laughs> anthems for decades. When you walk out onto stage, you're really wanting to respond to the music that's been written and the performances that are around you. And then you want to just share it with the people in front of you. It's a very impulsive, reflective, sort of inner burning thing that happens. And it's about the connections that you make. Today, he's stepping up with a dire warning about the world's largest live entertainment company, Live Nation. It also owns ticketing giant Ticketmaster. Live Nation's been fined hundreds of millions of dollars in the US for fraud and overcharging customers. Here in Australia, it's been increasing its power for over a decade. Spotify, TikTok, Live Nation. These are global entities. They are not accountable in our country. They are hardly regulated. They are quite often unethical. They have no loyalty to Australia or to Australian artists at all. And they are basically calling the shots. We were at ground zero. And there's never been harder for artists, but particularly younger and mid-range artists coming through. Over a thousand Australian live music venues have closed recently. Major festivals have been canceled with a devastating effect on grassroots artists. Peter Garrett's worried the combined effect of Live Nation's takeover and the rise of streaming have led to that. Without nurturing your local artists who are now getting washed away in a tidal wave of, you know, sort of you know, big companies, we're finding out that we don't have our... We're not hearing our songs. We're not hearing the things that, that connect us to the place that we're in. To me, that's a healthy country. You know, when we're listening to our songwriters and watching our performers. I don't think Live Nation cares at all about Australian artists. It's a proper sort of Australian bush experience, I guess, in this place. 
This natural phenomenon in southern Western Australia formed over 2.7 billion years. It's called Katakich in the local Noongar language, or wave rock. And each spring, it's the setting for a unique independent music festival that's making a stand against the corporatisation of the industry. This event is a sort of love show. You know, with all the talk about festivals collapsing and stuff, obviously it's a tiny event, but I'm proud of the fact I can announce it and sell the tickets. Paul Sloan's organised this festival for 18 years. He's one of Australia's top booking agents who helps big artists land and put on live gigs. Nick Cave, um, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, Amal and the Sniffers, um, Bonnie Iver. I'm about to do Tom York in Australia. Live shows are now the main income source for musicians, with streaming platforms making it so hard to make money. There's been a lot more disruption probably in our sector than most other sectors, but certainly I think that the consolidation of the music business that's been going on quite aggressively for the last few years, but uh, I guess five years, it's been noticeable. <laughs> this consolidation is being led by US company Live Nation. Live Nation are making the most money. Let's not hesitate to say that. Their share price has gone up and up and up and up. Is that good for music? Mm, jury's out on that one. How has the entry of Live Nation changed? Well, they fucked it up, basically. They pay too much for acts. They uh, don't care about whether they make a profit or loss. It's all about their share prices. We first reached out to Live Nation for an interview a month ago and spoke to the company's media team several times before they declined our interview request. Then, without seeing our program, the company started spamming people in Australia's live music industry, saying that our story was inaccurate, unbalanced and had an agenda. Finally, Live Nation responded to our detailed questions with a legal letter of complaint. It also said it's proud to have an office in Australia that champions local talent and fuels growth in the country's live music industry, creating thousands of jobs. There's a key supply chain behind most concerts. There's the artist, their manager, a booking agent like Paul Sloan, and the promoter, which finances the show, organises venues, ticketing and marketing. In the past, many of those players operated independently and Live Nation was one of the promoters. So the other company that's similar to them here and as aggressive, I guess, is TEG, which is Ticketek, and they also own promoter interests and venue interests. Live Nation is operating at such scale that it's difficult to avoid them, um, which does then obviously cause disruption inside the business, you know, the lack of choice. Many revenue roads lead to Live Nation. The company announced record earnings of roughly 23 billion US dollars last year. 
No other business has a financial stake in every part of Australia's live music industry. So Live Nation owns Mosh Ticks and Ticketmaster. It operates venues like the Palais Theatre in Melbourne, owns Anita's Theatre in Wollongong and Fortitude Music Hall in Brisbane. It owns Secret Sounds, the company behind festivals like Splendour in the Grass and Falls. It owns a major Australian booking agency, Village Sounds, which represents numerous artists. It owns touring companies and TSP merchandising, which makes band merch. So Live Nation can get paid numerous times for the one concert or tour, and a big slice of what you pay for as a fan, from ticketing to drinks and food to merchandise. That's vertical integration, and artists often don't know what's happening. So the Live Nation vertical model is, I book a venue in Australia, it's a Live Nation property, so whatever the venue charges are, an alternative agent or promoter using the venue is paying Live Nation to hire the room. It's a Ticketmaster venue because it's Live Nation venue, so it's also their ticketing business. The rights around the merchandise, any sponsorship money for the venue, obviously if the Live Nation is also the promoter of the show, it's, it's everything. It's 100% of the income for the show, it's pretty much staying within the walls of the company in some way. We tried to tell stories about the places that we've grown up in and lived and, and Australian stories. The music that backs that has always been very rooted in the live setting. Many musicians are worried about speaking out against Live Nation because of the repercussions to their careers. But one Adelaide band, Bad Dreams, is taking the risk after their most recent tour. For them, playing live shows is a unifying, full-body experience. It's exhilarating, it's transcendent, and importantly, that experience is connecting not only with your bandmates, but with, with a crowd. And so there's nothing else that I have ever done that's like that. Yeah, you get off stage with this, oh, for me, like a hugely elated feeling as if you've almost been baptised because I'm soaking wet mm. and I'm um, <laughs> so excited about what just happened. But um, yeah, it was, you wouldn't have it any other way. That's all part he of puts the story. His heart and soul into I'll it. give it a crack, yeah. Rolling Stone put Bad Dreams' debut album on a list of the greatest Australian records of all time. An opportunity came up to join booking agency Village Sounds, owned by Live Nation. They represent you and, I guess, you know, shop your band to venues for opportunities to play there. They also fill the positions for higher profile support so that you're playing much larger venues than you would have otherwise. The band got booked for a headline tour at Live Nation venues in 2023. It grossed um, about $100,000 of ticket sales and we ended up with about, I think, $9,000 in our bank account at the end after everything had been accounted for. The tour was promoted by a different company, but Live Nation owned other businesses involved. Then we realised, yeah, we were paying 10% to our booking agent. There was a ticketing fee. Then there were venue fees to the Live Nation owned venues. And then those Live Nation-owned venues were also taking a merch cut of the merch we sold. And so we were paying four times to Live Nation and we had no way, we, that wasn't, ex we had no way of negotiating that. And in fact, when we raised it with our booking agent, they were just, they sort of the shoulder shock. You know, a few thousand dollars um, 
of merch fees is a pittance to Live Nation. Um, it's a huge amount of money for, for a band like us. And um, it's very difficult to get answers or get alternative ways of doing things once you're intertwined in the, in the industry. Live Nation told us the economics of its business model follow the same industry practices as its competitors. It claims bands approve the budget for a tour, like venues, ticketing, merch fees, and the overall deal. I think we found it very hard to find advocates or representatives who will um, be able to explain things to you and advocate for you in contract matters or financial matters. Bad Dreams has now left Live Nation's booking agency Village Sounds. But many other major Australian artists like Bernard Fanning and G Flip are still on the company's roster. Artists don't expect to be making millions of dollars at our level or even making money. Like, we all have jobs to support our music career. Over the time, we started off very ignorant about how it works financially, um, which is obviously on us, but I don't think many musicians get into music with a background in any of that sort of thing. Overseas, very few artists speak openly about Live Nation's tactics. Every single step of buying a ticket, going and parking, going to the venue, seeing the show is, is owned mostly by the same companies who kind of own each other as well. Uh, so it means that price gouging is easy. If they want to take 10% of the revenues and call it a facility fee, they can and have. If they want to charge $30,000 for the house nut, they can and have. And if they want to charge us $250 for a stack of 10 clean towels, they can and have. If Mr. Lawrence and others are not getting the rate card on the service fees up front and having that made available to them, that's a problem on our end that I'll look into that coming out of like this. It seems like that needs to be there on the front end. I, I agree with that. So how many people does it take to put on Blues Fest? During the event and the loadout, it's 2,600 people are getting paid. These empty fields are a powerful example of the damage done to the industry. The iconic Australian festival, Blues Fest in Byron Bay, is ending. Sad to say it's the last one, but it doesn't have to be. Music festivals were once a thriving part of the Australian industry. Now several have been cancelled or shut down altogether. We're in an extinction event right now. The people are leaving this industry. Do we want to have our industry be decimated? And, and, in, and, and that is what I think we are facing right now. Festival Splendour in the Grass has run for over 20 years, also in the Byron Bay area. Live Nation acquired it in 2016. Two weeks after this year's tickets went on sale, the festival was cancelled. In the last two years, Live Nation has also shelved festivals at eight locations across the country including Spilt Milk, Falls and Harvest Rock. Live Nation told us it strategically postponed festivals to ensure premium fan experiences and that the company's confident they'll return. Splendour in the past, as they're now calling it, is um, no longer with us, but you only had to look at the shareholders' reports they were losing money, right? And I guess that's what happens when you're dealing with shareholders, that you get jettisoned. And I'm sorry to see that, because that was a great festival. 
In September, the New South Wales government announced $500,000 of emergency funding to save large festivals. Blues Fest previously received government funding, but Peter Noble says it's not enough. It costs us about $15, $16 million to put the event on. If they gave us, say, 20% of that, that would give us the confidence that we won't lose money in these times, or if we do, it won't be so much we can't continue. We're, we're not asking for a handout, but when I see imported events basically put on by multinationals get grant money, I go, well, I feel like the jilted wife. We wanted to find out how much funding Australian governments have given Live Nation. Documents we got under Freedom of Information show the company received tens of millions of dollars in taxpayer-funded grants, like $5 million for music festivals in New South Wales, some of which haven't gone ahead for years. 30000 for spilt milk in Canberra that was cancelled and 132000 for a podcasting festival which appears to have been abandoned. The New South Wales government told us grants were awarded for those festivals because they had a proven track record of delivering events. Live Nation told us it redirected money for the New South Wales festivals to other events and to retain staff during COVID, and that all grant rules have been followed. The company said the Spilt Milk grant will go to next year's event, and the Podcasting Festival grant has been returned. The foot soldiers of Australian live music are gathering to save the industry at a conference in Brisbane called Big Sound. They've flown in Mark David to help. Can I please ask you to put your hands together and give a big, big sound welcome to Mark David. In the UK, he's leading the fight to save small venues while Live Nation's boasting of record attendance at its concerts. It's frankly disgraceful that the biggest companies in the music industry are prepared to see small venues that get them that talent closing down. They should be ashamed of that. They need to be a call to account. You put on one of the first Oasis gigs, right? I put on the second show of their Supersonic tour, which eventually did 34 dates. Yeah, I didn't want to, though, but the agent insisted that we had to have this other band on the bill. And I said, well, who the hell are they? And it turned out they were Oasis. Of those 34 venues where Oasis first played, how many are still open? 11. 23 have closed in the last 30 years. Would they ever have become Oasis if they hadn't have played those 34 shows? You've got to be bad before you're good. Live Nation is a, a shareholder company. It is an investment house, frankly, where people put money in expecting a return. Live Nation's shareholders include an investment fund controlled by the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Mark David says Live Nation only invests in an artist once they're famous enough to drive profits, letting others take the losses involved in developing them. We're talking around the world, generally around 1,500 capacity. At 1,500 capacity, the ticket price and the number of people in the room will be sufficient to get you to a profitable live show. If there is nobody developing the talent from the ground up, expecting it to arrive at 1,500 capacity and be able to sell out an arena and stuff, that seems a massive leap in the dark to me. Live Nations recently bought venues at that size, but told us it also promoted over 900 shows in small venues for developing artists and that it runs programs to help emerging musicians. 
Live Nation bought into this venue, Fortitude Music Hall, and it opened in 2019. It's got a capacity of about 3,300 people, which means it's the only venue of this size here in Brisbane. And the company says it's filling a much needed gap in the market. That also means every gig of that size that comes through Brisbane goes in this Live Nation venue. We've also heard that Live Nation has been trying to buy other venues here in Brisbane and it's vying for the rights to build an arena for the Brisbane Olympics that could also host major live shows. Mark David's pitching a solution to stop small venues from shutting down. A ticket levy where a dollar from every ticket for a major concert would go to a struggling part of the industry. The UK Parliament endorsed the concept, but asked companies like Live Nation to be proactive in rolling it out. I think we can pretty clearly say, doesn't matter how many times they say they're prepared to do it, the will simply isn't there to get it done. The first test for the company to roll out the levy was when tickets for Oasis's surprise comeback tour in the UK went on sale last month. Live Nation won the contract to promote the British band's reunion and used its company Ticketmaster to sell the tickets. This is the first big one and they failed. Simple as that. There's no point in sugarcoating it. 415 euro for a standing ticket cause of fucking Ticketmaster. It's hell in there. It's horror. You Live Nation and Ticketmaster then faced a public pay. outcry. 500 pounds. Fuck off. Oasis fans waited hours to get tickets. Once they finally got through the online queue, prices were much higher than originally advertised. They have gone ridiculously up. It's a concept called dynamic pricing. As a show gets more popular, its ticket price goes up. It's another way Live Nation's making a killing. That's caused a huge, huge press and media attention in the UK, and we have the UK government now looking at dynamic pricing. It unlocked a public battle over who's responsible for setting ticket prices. Oasis said it didn't know dynamic pricing would be used. Ticketmaster blamed the band. Live Nation told us there's no algorithmic surge pricing system, but the company offers artists tools for them to understand demand. Live Nation and Ticketmaster are now using dynamic pricing in Australia, most recently for punk band Green Day's tour. What's really frustrating music fans is the rising cost of tickets. We've discovered Ticketmaster and its Australian competitor Ticketek are secretly charging you numerous fees. We've been leaked confidential documents revealing just how this happens. For a gig at the Live Nation operated Palais Theatre in Melbourne, tickets over $65 are slapped with a hidden service fee of $3.18 a hidden booking fee of $6.77 and a hidden credit card fee, which they curiously call an infrastructure fee of 13 cents. That's roughly $10 in fees you aren't told about. Ticketmaster then charges you a transaction fee of more than $7. This one's public. If it's a Ticketmaster resale, that fee jumps to around $17. And you can pay up to $11 for ticket insurance depending on the gig. In total, that's around $30 to $40. So they're called transaction fees, booking fees, service fees, infrastructure fees. There's like about 10 names that have come out of nowhere. I used to run a ticket business and I used to have a booking fee. It's one name and it was cheap and I still made money. And then there's often a fee called the inside charge. Paul Sloan is one of multiple industry people we've spoken to who can't get a straight answer about it. And I say to venues all the time, what is the inside charge for? And they say, you know, it's the inside charge. It's a multi-billion dollar company that can lose money because they're supported by a ticket business which is, is really charging money for things that don't exist. 
We didn't find out what the inside charge is either. We know that there's a fee there and no one's ever explained to us mm. what it entails. And as you go on and you set, keep looking at the bank account and trying to work out how you're going to record your next album or do your next tour, you do start to ask questions and um, the answers to those questions are pretty hard to find. On the ticket prices, because Live Nation says the artist sets the ticket price and gets the majority of that share. Is that true? The artist does set a range of ticket price to where it is. The artist doesn't set the booking fee, doesn't set any other hidden fees that exist within that ticket price, of which there are plenty of examples. So the artist is not receiving uh, that amount that's reflected in the ticket price. Live Nation said Ticketmaster doesn't set fees, but venues do, to cover costs for the venue and ticketing company. It said Ticketmaster discloses certain fees which support services like tech development and innovation, customer service, security and compliance. And the cost of touring has dramatically increased after COVID, so ticket prices need to compensate touring artists for that. Live Nation own the venues, they are the promoters and they own the ticket company. Put those three things together and they are controlling what the tickets are. Rival Ticketek told us that any fees are for the investment in services to improve consumer ticketing experiences. Midnight Oil is one of Australia's most successful rock bands, selling out gigs in the US and Europe. We've had to play at Live Nation venues in cities in America because there are no other venues because Live Nation has them all tied up. We're not at the point of where the US is. What will that mean for Australia? Well, it'll mean increased ticket prices for starters. It'll mean a lack of diversity in the way in which um, people are presented. But most importantly, it will be a lack of competition. We've seen more than 1,300 small venues in Australia shut down in the last couple of years. How does that make you feel, seeing those small venues shut? I think it's terrible that the small venues have closed down. I mean, that's where people of my generation, musicians of my generation, that's... I mean, we never would have emerged if we couldn't have played in small venues. That's the truth of it. I would say that the best way for me to describe how I feel about it is that I'm a cultural patriot, you know, and I believe that we need to make sure that governments have rules in place to protect and nourish Australian artists and that Australian fans uh, get the opportunity and do take up that opportunity to support them as well. And at the moment, that's not happening. Australia's Arts Minister has put Live Nation on notice. I don't think there's any doubt that we are heading down a pathway where these sorts of anti-competitive risks are go going to exist within the music sector. So I put down a, a very clear warning to the companies on that. Yes, you can buy different parts of a, of a supply chain, that's all true, but you can't then use that in an anti-competitive way. And increasingly, we are hearing those complaints from artists, from venues, from festivals. One thing that Live Nation is doing here, like it is in other countries, is using dynamic pricing. It's being investigated in the UK. Should it be allowed in Australia? Surge pricing is something that, as consumers, people have always dealt with. I don't love it, but I think we have to be realistic. It's always been there. It's not something we're looking at at the moment. It's not something we're looking at at the moment. One of Australia's top rappers, Barker, is trying to sidestep the corporate players. <laughs> of course, yeah. She's amassed such a following, she's now touring independently. Most of our tours, we're self-run. That's not easy for artists because it costs a lot of money to put on shows. <laughs> she's hosting a listening party for her new EP, where you can get a free tattoo. Definitely. We're all twinning. 
money's like good when it is, but it's like, you know, that it's like there's still money getting taken out of our mouths at the same time. Like it could, could be better if we weren't lining the pockets of, yeah, people. Yeah. Dodgy cunts, yeah. <laughs> Maybe don't say oh, that. Oh, <laughs> dodgy fuckwits. Nah, um... Uh. <laughs> Barker recently won Artist of the Year at the National Indigenous Music Awards. She says the government needs to regulate live music. It's kind of like a, you know, a cowboy industry where we're kind of like... We don't have regulations, we don't have sick leaves, we don't have benefits or nothing. I feel like I've met more trustworthy crackheads than I have people in this industry, and, and that says a lot, yeah. What's a promoter actually do? Risk his balls every day. In Australia, there are three big promoters. Live Nation's biggest competitor here, veteran Michael Chugg and his business partner, Frontier Touring, who brought artists like Paul McCartney and Elton John to Australia, among the most profitable shows last year. TEG, which made over $220 million last year and owns Ticketek, the largest ticketing agent in Australia, and Live Nation, which says there's more competition in the industry than ever before. Its global profits and management of hundreds of artists like Coldplay are helping it edge out Australian promoters. Well, I lost Coldplay to Live Nation. That's the biggest one I've lost to them. I started with Coldplay in the 200-seater venue way back, and we built together to get... And we got it to stadiums, and so Live Nation offered them a worldwide tour. And I know that Chris Martin didn't want to leave us, but in the end, Live Nation just kept adding millions and millions, and in the end, we lost out. You've had a strong relationship with Chris Martin. I mean, how did he feel about letting you go? Well, he... <laughs> Money speaks. I mean, it's... They're not going to throw away another whatever it was. They're not going to throw that away to stay loyal to us. We asked Live Nation if it gave Coldplay millions to secure its tours in Australia, and the company said no. Before Live Nation entered the country, Chug, along with the late Michael Gadinsky, were Australia's top dogs. Before Live Nation came into the picture, do you think you had that sort of domination, you and Gadinsky? No, I suppose so. We didn't abuse it, though. Why did you both come back together? To fight Live Nation. We've survived and continue to survive is we're promoters. If we've got a tour and, or a festival or anything and it goes on sale and it's not good, we don't cancel it. We work our asses off to try and make it at least break even or take the potential loss from a million dollars to a hundred thousand dollars. They don't. They cancel it. We put this to Live Nation and the company denied it. Michael Chugg says he and Frontier have managed to keep touring megastars in Australia who've been frustrated by Live Nation's work overseas. Taylor Swift is a key example of that. A debacle over Ticketmaster's sales for her US tour prompted American politicians to question whether Live Nation's business model is legal. You can't have too much consolidation, something that unfortunately for this country, as a uh, ode to Taylor Swift, I will say, we know all too well. In 2010, the US government allowed Live Nation and Ticketmaster to combine. Despite concerns, it would allow them to dominate the industry and eventually create situations like Taylor Swift's US tour. The merger was approved on the condition they wouldn't use their power to punish businesses which use other ticket providers. Back in 2010, Live Nation promised the United States government they weren't going to be doing all the bad things that they did to me. Live Nation violated, in my beliefs, the consent degree order within a few months, trying to block ticketing and block my entire event. 
This is my trial prep room. Live Nation's facing several lawsuits in the US, including from promoter Tommy Dorfman. In 2011, he planned a large dance music festival in New Jersey. But he says Live Nation used aggressive tactics. They threatened to withhold ticketing for future events. They acted like wild animals. They said, we are going to block all your ticketing. You will not get ticketing. We're going to block all your talent. Everything disappeared. We went from having the biggest EDM festival in the East Coast of the United States to nothing. Goodbye. It was gone. Tommy lost his music business. Now he's selling cable door to door. Hello. Hello, how you doing? Hi. I'm Tommy from RDA Enterprises representing us down broadband. Do you guys have internet or cable phone internet in your house? He's been waiting 13 years for his case against Live Nation to go to trial. I'm Tommy, nice to meet you. His cause was taken up by a prominent member of Congress, the late Bill Pascrell. I do not want Live Nation's money. I want to take this to a jury and I want justice. In court filings, Live Nation denied many of the allegations in Tommy's case or said there was insufficient evidence to prove them. I would tell you, government, don't listen to Live Nation. Uh, stop it now. Stop it now. Protect the independent promoters, protect the artists, and protect the fans that are getting ripped off. Now, Live Nation's facing its biggest battle yet. The US Department of Justice and dozens of American states are suing the company. We allege that Live Nation has illegally monopolized markets across the live concert industry in the United States for far too long. It is time to break it up. In a recent interview with Bloomberg, Live Nation CEO Michael Rapino said he thought the US Department of Justice had rewritten the rules on vertical integration. Are we vertical? Of course we're vertical. We, we, every promoter from history has been vertical because that's how you pay the bills. We have filed this lawsuit on behalf of the American people. It is time for fans and artists to stop paying the price for Live Nation's monopoly. I feel like artists, this is our industry, you know. This is ours, you know. We're the ones that keep it rolling. If it wasn't for us, we wouldn't have an industry. So you're gonna shoot a proper in the back? Huh? Black mother at a doorstep. Barker's playing a national tour. Her fan base is dedicated, and her lyrics tell stories about her life in Australia. You just see constantly the people who actually are out here putting their life experiences on the line just for somebody to come in and gobble up, like, benefit and, and profit off people's pain and trauma and, you know, their stories. Can we just enjoy and, and thrive and, and create rather than being in survival mode and always having our back up about people doing us dodgy or taking and ripping everything away from us. And I think as artists, like, yeah, we need to take back that power. We need to be more vocal. Write diss tracks to Live Nation. <laughs> like, do something, guys. My advice to Australian government would be don't wait. These companies, there's nothing evil or, or wrong about them in, inherently, but they are avaricious. And the way to curtail that is to have a regulatory system in which they can operate to do that within certain limits and certain controls. Just letting them do it without any kind of controls doesn't work. When all else fails, live music is supposed to bring people together. The concern felt by so many in the industry is that Live Nation's move to make it an expensive luxury item is threatening the grassroots traditions that have made Australia's scene unique. 
very disappointing they've been let into Australia and it's, it may be very difficult to, you know, unwind that. My personal belief is that music is there at all the important moments of most of our lives. And unless we recognise the value of that, it can quite quickly disappear. What makes us human in a way is artists sharing their sense of things, their stories, with the people who they've grown up with or who they live nearby or who they're visiting. And that's why people still go out to shows. A country without its own music is a country without a soul. Yeah.